Thank you, guys. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, why I believe that Detroit is the next unicorn capital. So uh, just to, to set context here, when I say unicorn capital, first of all, unicorns, the sort of mythical creatures that are startups that somehow defy the odds and go from being nothing to being worth over a billion dollars. And when I say a unicorn capital, uh, I mean taking that and building a city or a region around that where multiple unicorns can be created over and over again. Um, so we'll, we'll talk through that. I believe that Detroit has the opportunity to be the next unicorn capital. Uh, and so real quick, I'm, I'm the co-founder of Assembler Labs. We are Detroit's startup studio. So by that, I mean I have probably the coolest job in the city, uh, which is to think up crazy ideas all day long, validate them. The vast majority of them we look at in some period of time from 24 hours later to three months later, and we say that was the worst idea we could have possibly had. Uh, we're never going to do that. We're never going to turn that into a business. And a few of the ideas we say, oh, that's actually really good. We want to turn this into a business. We spin it out. We bring in people who can run those businesses. And the idea is that we want to create as many unicorns as possible here in Detroit. Um, so our goal is we want to create six to eight businesses over the next two to three years, all of which have the opportunity to be a billion dollar business. I will give you more of my background in a second. But before I do that, I want to tell you guys a story. And it's a story of a city. Um, I'm not going to name the city at all. If you guys know the city, just, just hang on. I promise I'll get there at the end. Uh, this is a city that was a, really a city that was blue collar, built on the back of manufacturing, um, had been through many boom and bust cycles. So as the economy went up, it did really well on manufacturing. As the economy went down, it did really poorly on manufacturing. And about, I don't know, a few years ago, it really hit rock bottom. And um, population declined in, in a period of about 10 or so years. Population declined about 10 to 15% in the city. Um, weeds started growing on the streets. Weeds started growing in the sidewalks. Weeds started growing in abandoned buildings. It was so bad that people were making jokes, will the last person to leave the city please turn the lights out? Right? Like it, was, it was, for all intents and purposes, considered a dead city at this point. And then one company came in that was a single company that decided, it was sort of like a small-ish company, but relatively successful. And it decided, you know what, we are going to move from the suburbs into the downtown area, and we are going to turn that into our new uh, headquarters. And honestly, that single company became a, a big whooshing sound that was sucking up all of the talent in the region, bringing all of the talent to that one city. Uh, and honestly, just started to revitalize the city from there, like single-handedly. And uh, as, it was, as that whooshing sound was happening, as it was bringing in literally thousands of people, one of the things that we saw was founders started to emerge. So these people were wrapped up in uh, in, in sort of seeing the growth of this business, enjoying what they were seeing, and saying, you know what, I want to go do this again. I want to start from scratch and build something. And so these founders started emerging. They became the people that, that started new companies. There were not many of them. There were like, we're talking uh, a dozen or so of these people, right? Not, not many at all. And, um, and they, started, they started to actually create a community around each other, which was really cool. This is an actual email from, from that time. I'm going to read it because I think it's, it's kind of hilarious uh, and also has a little anecdote about, about rent and neighborhoods, which I think is, is funny as well. So it, we also recently organized a group where motivated entrepreneurs like yourself can meet to discuss technology and business, which you should attend. Perhaps you'll find ideas and friends who will help make your startup huge. And then it goes on to talk about rent. Both neighborhoods are good, but very different in flavor. Neighborhood one tends to be more expensive, but both are pricey. There are sketchy pockets in both, especially in neighborhood two. I'd suggest looking around both places, spend a few days getting lost in each of them. In general, a one bedroom is somewhere around 600 to to $1,000 or so. Uh, I think that's uh, very nostalgic and quaint to, to see that, those rent prices. Um, and so these founders started coming. You had about a dozen of them. And there was one big company bringing it together. And it started this beehive effect. Uh, so Steve Jobs used to like to talk about this beehive effect. And the beehive effect was when there is a swarm of people that coalesce around a region that allow that region allows that region to grow exponentially that it otherwise could not have done. 
Uh, and he talks about it with Silicon Valley. And, and one of the things that he says, uh, Steve Jobs says this, is that you are better off starting a company in Silicon Valley than Montana. Because if you start a, a company in Silicon Valley, when you go recruit somebody to join your startup, all you have to do to that, to, to that person is say, hey, take a right at this stop sign to get to our office versus taking a left to go to your current job. And he's like, if you start a company in Montana, you have to say, hey, you're going to have to quit your job. You're going to have to tell your, your spouse to quit their job. You're going to have to uproot your kids and move them and change their schools. You're going to have to sell your house. You're going to have to buy a new house. And then if you go over to, that, to, that, uh, to Montana, to that company, if that company fails, which by the way, it probably will, now you have no job. You have nowhere else that you're going to go. So you're going to have to tell your spouse to quit their job again. You're going to have to uproot your kids again. You're going to have to sell your house. You're going to have to move to another place. It's like in Silicon Valley, if, you, if your, uh, your company uh, fails, you turn left at the stop sign and sort of right again. Right? That's, that's the alternative. So you had this one company that was doing sort of incredibly well, growing really fast. You had these, these few people that were starting companies. They started to grow a little bit. And then you had uh, this beehive effect happening, which brought in other companies. So other companies started saying, you know what? We can have an office in that, in that city. And that, uh, that really started to, to, to grow things and, and start that, that virtuous cycle. In startups, there's a, there's a horrible phenomenon, which is that the companies that are, are going to succeed take the longest to succeed. And that's sort of by definition, right? If a company is going to fail, it's like, well, the market wasn't really large. Customers didn't want this thing. You find that out pretty quickly. But if a company is going to succeed, it takes a few years, five, 10 years, to get to a billion dollars. So what you end up seeing is failures happen first. And what that does is when failures happen first, it chills the entire city. So in this case, we saw a few failures. And everybody was like, oh, maybe, maybe we're not cut out for this. Right? Like maybe we shouldn't be the ones starting startups and starting companies. Maybe we should just work for the, the big manufacturing companies that we've, that we've traditionally worked for. Uh, so it really put a damper on what was happening for a couple of years. You saw it slow down. Um, and it was kind of like a, a, an, an ice bucket on your head is really the only way to describe it. But then you, you spend a couple of years in this, in this doldrums, and you start to see a little bit more success. So one company starts growing, hiring a bunch of people. Maybe they get a couple hundred people. <laughs> Another company was, was acquired. Uh, I think our, you know, a few years in was when, um, when we saw the, the first company really start to succeed. So the successes came later. And as the successes came, the money followed. So this is one of the things that we saw was money never leads in a, uh, in a startup ecosystem. You can't throw money at the problem and magically have a lot of successful startups. You have successful startups founded by people, and then the money follows. And the money follows in many different ways. The money follows into those companies, which allows them to hire more people. The money follows to individuals, which allows them to make more money, uh, invest in other ways. Um, and generally speaking, that was really good in this city. Money, money brought a lot of goodness. It, it helped. But it, it wasn't all good the city dealt with a lot of gentrification really, really quickly. And they had problems uh, where people were getting kicked out of their homes that they had been in for a long time, weren't really able to handle that. Uh, so money definitely brought some problems with it, and, and they had to sort that out in this city. Um, so this probably sounds familiar. Um, some of you might be thinking that is the story of Detroit over the last 10 or so years. Um, it's not, actually. I am talking about Seattle. So going back to my experience here, uh, I grew up in this area. I grew up in the suburbs. I then left and went straight to Seattle, where I joined Amazon in 2005 and then again in 2006. Um, and that city felt almost exactly like Detroit feels today or over the last few years. Um, Amazon was, a, was a, the startup that was doing relatively well, obviously. Um, but it wasn't what it is today by any means. And they had moved from Bellevue, which is the suburbs of Seattle, into downtown Seattle. Uh, and then really, everything took off around them. They, they sucked in tens of thousands of people. A few people started to leave. I left in 2009, uh, and I went to found a startup. We had no idea what the heck we were doing. We then spent the next few years growing it. 
a couple of our peers failed, and, and we were like, well, maybe we shouldn't be doing this. Uh, we somehow managed to succeed. We sold that business. We, we grew a, a large business. We had about 350 employees uh, by the time I left. And, um, and yeah, now Seattle is totally the unicorn capital. Um, it's incredible what has happened here. So this is about, I don't know, this is like seven or eight of the unicorns that are still private, haven't been bought, but worth over a billion dollars today. Um, I know many of these folks who have done this, and it's been fascinating to watch what they've done. So as an example, Outreach, uh, if you guys haven't heard of Outreach, it's a, um, a tool for sales, uh, for sales teams. And Outreach was, was one of those examples of the early failures that turned into success. So they were down to about two weeks of cash left in their bank account uh, because they were actually a company called Group Talent. They were not called Outreach. And Group Talent was this idea that uh, Companies that were hiring engineers would rather hire teams of engineers than single engineers at a time because they already know how to work with each other. And so they were basically selling teams of engineers to other companies. Uh, nobody actually wanted that. That's not the way people hire today. So they were down to the last two weeks of cash in their bank. And what they found out was that the people that they were talking to were most impressed with the technology that they had built internally to contact those, those companies. And so they were like, we would buy that from you. And they were like, oh, OK. Uh, and now they are no longer group talent. They are outreach. Um, I'm going to come back here to my notes for a second, because I, I think this is really particularly interesting. This is just a smattering of those that are, are non-public, haven't been bought yet. Um, but it doesn't include any of the companies that have IPO'd or have exited so far. So going through a couple of those, a few of those, Amazon, Microsoft, Expedia, Zillow, Redfin, Redfin Big, Big Fish Games, Avo, F5 Networks, Smartsheet, Blue Nile, Zulily, Real Networks, PopCap, DocuSign, Impinge, Avalara, Aptio, Blue Origin. Like there's, a, there's a ton of companies. Those all, by the way, aside from Amazon, Expedia, and, and Microsoft, were founded in like the last 10 years or so. Uh, so Seattle has turned into a unicorn capital 100%. So taking a step back, that's, that's Seattle. That's the experience that I saw. I think that if you look at what that looked like at the time, and you compare that to what we have in Detroit today, there are some common ingredients that sort of become obvious around what is going to make a, a unicorn capital. And then we can talk through why I believe that Detroit has most of those ingredients and needs to work on a couple of those things as well. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk through that. So um, I said this earlier, but I believe that founders are superheroes. They are the ones that are willing to, to go out and be super courageous and just make it happen. Uh, so I think that, that if I were to have one single slide on this deck around what makes a unicorn capital, it would, it would just be talent. It would be the people. Okay? Like The people are, is everything. That is what makes a, a, a unicorn capital. I think Detroit has an unbelievable base of talent. Um, I was really surprised in some ways, I like kind of ashamed to say that. But I was, I was surprised by that when I came back, because you don't think about Detroit as sort of like a startup hub with, with a ton of really impressive technical talent and engineering talent and people who care about technology. But it actually has a, a lot of technology and a lot of tech workers. So again, comparing Detroit to Seattle, it's a, it's a fun comparison on population because Metro Seattle and Metro Detroit are roughly the same size. The city of Seattle and the city of Detroit are roughly the same size. Um, and if you look at number of tech workers, so th this is defined as uh, people who are like engineers, things like that in, in the area. Metro Seattle has about 200,000, which you're like, oh, cool, that's, that's a lot of people. I'd expect that. I'd expect there's a lot of folks in technology there. Um, I was not expecting Detroit to have almost as, as many with a, over 170,000. So that was really interesting. And then if you look at the number of STEM grads per year in Metro Seattle versus Metro Detroit, we have about 50% more. But if you take it, uh, this stat is not listed here. If you take it one step further, and you look at sort of the four-hour driving radius of Metro Seattle, the four-hour driving radius of Metro Seattle is essentially Seattle, Vancouver to the north, uh, Spokane to the east, and Portland to the south. That's really all you have. University of Washington, maybe University of British Columbia, are your two uh, schools that really exceed, uh, succeed at um, uh, technology and engineering. If you look at the four-hour driving radius of Metro Detroit, you have Detroit, you have Ann Arbor, you have Lansing, 
you have the west side of the state, you have Pittsburgh with Carnegie Mellon and Pitt, you have Notre Dame and Purdue and Indiana and Indiana, you can go down to Ohio to the schools there, you can go over to University of Toronto in Canada, you can head to Chicago to University of Chicago, Northwestern, uh, UIC even. So really like an incredible amount of, of highly qualified people uh, in just a four hour driving radius that Se even Seattle doesn't have. But we are super anemic when it comes to startups. Right? We just do not have nearly the amount. So that's where I think the opportunity lies in getting people to, to move forward, and we'll talk about that. So <coughs> talent is the first ingredient. I could probably stop the presentation there, and, and, uh, and that would be it. I think it, it accounts for at least three quarters of what's going to make a, a city become a unicorn capital. I think Detroit has that. But money is really important. I mentioned this briefly when we were talking about money as the Seattle story, but money always follows talent. Money never leads. So this one is solely dependent on do you have the talent there already? And if you do and they start to start startups, the money will always be there. Um, let's look at what that looked like. I, I think of this as if you build it, the money will come. And uh, this is Seattle over, this is like 2000, let's just use 2010 to 2015, because I think 2016 wasn't a full year in this report. Um, this is number of deals, so how much money was raised by companies uh, throughout the years in Seattle. So you can see this, this grew really, really quickly. Uh, it's almost, it was like almost double or so in five years. But if you look more closely, the the places where the increases actually happened is this light purple. The light purple is seed deals. So that's the earliest stage financing, companies that are just getting started. Uh, so that's where all of the growth happened was at the seed stage, uh, which is very, very young companies. And then if you come over to the other side and you map that against, that is the number of deals and amount of investment that has been put into Seattle-based companies by investors not based in Washington state. You can see that, that that rises almost exactly with the amount that it rises on the seed deals. So Seattle companies are getting a significant portion of their dollars today from investors who are not based in Seattle. So again, money follows the, the talent in the companies. And we see that today already here in Detroit. So it's not that Seattle is some special thing where they're like an hour and a half flight from San Francisco and that's what does it. It's that people who manage money and large amounts of money are going to find the best deals wherever that may be. So Duo, which I think many of you already know, has exited for a couple billion dollars. Tier one uh, Silicon Valley investors, Redpoint, True, and Google Ventures. Um, StockX, also tier one. Uh, Battery, GGV, General Atlantic. I actually think Google is in there too, right? Um, so that's money. Money will follow. So I think talent, we've got the talent. Money, we've got the money. Even if it's not actually headquartered here, it will be here. It is here. Uh, anchor companies. So you know, I, I mentioned Amazon as the anchor company that really drove Seattle's resurgence. And I, I think anchor companies are really important because they bring tens of thousands of people who want to see growth and want to see what it looks like to execute at a really high level. So in Seattle, those two anchor companies are Microsoft and Amazon. That's, that's really it. Um, in Detroit, I, I think we actually have significant amounts of anchor companies, uh, starting with Quicken, GM, Ford, right? And I, I would say if there is something that we've done poorly in, in Detroit with the anchor companies, it's that people have gotten stuck at those companies for a really long time. Right? Um, I don't think that's going to be the case over the next 10 years or so. What you're seeing with the automotive companies in particular is that they have to be completely reinvented. They're going to have to bring in a completely different talent base as well. Uh, they're going to have to hire a lot of software folks in particular. And I think that that alone is going to see them go from sort of very stable careers to very crazy up or crazy down if they fail. Um, but we have the opportunity for those to be anchor companies that are going to, to spit out, bring in a bunch of talent, and then spit out some of it into startups as well. Um, supporting companies. So uh, the companies that, that create that beehive effect, the companies that will put a satellite office. Satellite offices in Seattle was a, a, a big deal. 
So there was a lot of folks that would set up offices in Seattle such that they could hire 100 people, a couple hundred people, whatever it may be, um, and use that talent. And then that talent would learn from those companies and go out and start their own companies from there. So left side, Google, uh, there's a couple thousand employees in Google in, in Seattle. Uh, Facebook has a couple thousand employees. Stripe, Uber both have a few hundred employees. There's like a dozen or more of these companies. Snapchat has a big office in Seattle, uh, so on and so forth. So there's a lot in Seattle. But I, I think we forget about what Metro Detroit has as well. We have a lot of these satellite offices. You guys clearly won here. Uh, Amazon has a couple hundred employees. Microsoft, I think, has a couple hundred. Twitter, LinkedIn have, have offices. Where I think we need to get better in this one is that um, not enough of these offices for us have software engineering talent. Right? Uh, Amazon's probably the, the leader of those. So uh, great, like, I think you need all sorts of talent. I think you need plenty of sales, you need plenty of marketing, you need plenty of support. Uh, but I think you also need engineering talent to build engineering companies. I would like to see more of that as well. All right, so I think we have talent, money, supporting companies, anchor companies. Risk tolerance is clearly an ingredient that goes into will a, will a region become a unicorn capital? I would just reframe this a little bit, I think. Even though I wrote risk tolerance, I'd reframe it as courage. Um, and when you reframe it as courage, it's, it's do the people in the city have the courage to go out and start businesses? Because that is not an easy task, right? And, um, and it's funny because I, I think when you talk in particular about Silicon Valley, you think of San Francisco, you think of the Bay Area, people talk about, well, they have, they have such a high risk tolerance over there. I kind of think that's BS. I, I, I actually think that they have the lowest risk tolerance of any city creating startups. Uh, and the reason is, in San Francisco, if you have a good job at, a, let's say, a big tech company, and you want to go start a business, you can go out, and the likelihood that you're going to raise money at literally like the week after you leave is the highest there that it is in any other place. So that's, that's number one. You're probably going to go out and raise some money. So you're taking on the lowest financial risk. And number two is, if you fail there, failure is not a scarlet letter at all. It's kind of expected. You're probably going to go get another job at another big tech company and get a promotion from where you were at. Right? Like it's the least risky thing that you could possibly do. Whereas here, if you go out and you go do that, uh, it, you have to be super courageous to go do that and say, you know what, I'm going to give up my cushy job. I'm going to go and I'm going to start a company. And I may or may not raise money because there's less money here. Uh, and if I do or I don't, I'm still going to go for it. And if I do fail, which is the likely outcome, people are going to say, oh, that person failed. And I may or may not get an, a, a job back at my original company. So I think we need to reframe that here. Um, I think it should be no scarlet letter. We, as a startup studio, when we partner with potential founders, we do not care whatsoever whether or not they have failed. Uh, in fact, if anything, it's a good sign for us that they're willing to be that courageous and go do it. Density. So this is back to that beehive effect, um, where I think you want a swarm, both physically and sort of culturally. right? And um, one of the best things about Metro Detroit is that we have Ann Arbor. Uh, there's both Detroit and Ann Arbor. And one of the worst things about Metro Detroit is that we have Ann Arbor, and there's both Detroit and Ann Arbor. Um, so uh, I, I think Detroit and Ann Arbor need to come together. Right? Like we need to actually figure out ways to come together and work together. You guys are probably like the best example here at Google with the Detroit office and the Ann Arbor office of being able to figure out how to do that. But I think that we need to figure that out. So culturally, we need to figure out density and what that looks like. And then physically, we need to figure out how do we sort of coalesce around a core? And I, I believe that's the downtown core. I think that's where, in particular, younger millennials who are entering the workforce want to be. And, and so that's, over the next 20 years, where the growth is going to come from. Um, I have this, uh, this guy I, I look up to. I don't know him at all, but he's, um, his, his name is Bill Gross. There's two famous Bill Grosses. The first is an investor. And the second is this guy, who is um, he creates companies. So he runs a, a company called Idea Lab. He's been doing this since the dot-com bubble. He's actually responsible for inventing the business model that is paid search. Um, and, uh, and so he has been doing this forever. He's, he's, he's in Pasadena, California. And he's started, I think, a couple hundred businesses. 
And uh, in that's maybe over 20 years or something. And a couple of years ago, a few years ago, he went out and he said, what are the common characteristics uh, of these businesses that succeeded? And what are the common characteristics of businesses that he started that failed? And what are different about them, right? So what makes some, something succeed versus something fail? And so he was looking at, you know, all right, was the, was the market big enough? Was the market a good market? Did customers care? Did we have a good team? Uh, you know, all, all of that. And it turned out that the only thing that all of the businesses that succeeded had in common, which the businesses that failed did not, was timing. Was it the right time for this business to be invented or not? And so I think that's true at a business level. I also think that's true at a, a region level, a city level. Is this the right time for a city to become a unicorn capital? When I looked at Seattle 15 years ago, like it clearly was the right time, right? Amazon was growing like crazy. Microsoft was doing really well. People were excited about moving to the West Coast in general. Like the timing was right. If I look at today here in Detroit, I'm not sure that there's ever been a better time in a single city in this country to become a unicorn capital than right now in Detroit. Um, this is a city full of people who have seen the worst, have figured out how to get out of it. We are like have some amount of confidence, right? Where we think that we can do this, and I believe that we can do this. Uh, and taking a risk is like it's it's worthwhile at this point, right? It's it's. You know, we don't know what's going to happen over the next 10 years to the established companies anyways, so why not go take that risk now? Um, so I think timing is as good as it could possibly be uh, for, for Detroit to become the next unicorn capital. And then lastly, I'm, I'm just a huge believer in luck. Uh, I think luck is completely underrated as a, a reason why people succeed. If you look at it from a, a city perspective, again, comparing Detroit to Seattle, there was zero way that anybody could have planned or predicted that some guy named Jeff Bezos was going to get in a car with his wife and drive from Texas to Seattle to start a company that sold books online. Uh, and that happened to turn into one of the world's most valuable companies. Uh, it just you, couldn't, you could not have planned it. That was pure luck for Seattle to get that. Um, even before that, it was pure luck for Bill Gates to have been born in Seattle. right? Uh, that, that you cannot plan for that. So we need luck. I have no way of knowing if we have luck. I do believe that you can manufacture serendipity, and serendipity and luck look pretty close to each other, but we'll see. So that's, that's my last thing. Uh, so it's, it's already happening, I think, is one of the really interesting things, is that we, we don't consider ourselves a unicorn capital yet, but I think that's mostly like lagging uh, in our head more than anything else. We already have four unicorns, so Duo has exited one stream software. They sold about 50% of their business to uh, KKR, the private equity company, and valued it at over a billion dollars. StockX now worth a billion dollars. Rivian, I think they raised like $700 million or something like that from Amazon. Uh, and then I think there's a, there's a whole generation of other companies between Detroit and Ann Arbor that are on their way to becoming a billion dollars. So Bollinger is making like EV stuff. Um, Equal is actually our first spin out. Equal is changing primary care for Americans in general. May Mobility, I bet you guys know, Bloomscape sells flowers and, and plants online. Um, Clink and Census, I, I think Clink, or uh, one of those has raised like $50 million now. I, I can't remember, both Ann Arbor. Uh, Guard Hat, Work at Health is actually solving the opioid crisis in America, and doing opioid addiction treatment, which is really impressive. So I think there's a whole bunch of startups. Uh, I didn't, even, didn't label them all by any means. But I think there's a whole bunch of startups that have the chance to succeed. So I'm a, I'm a big believer. I think Detroit's on its way. And that's why I think it's going to be the next unicorn capital. Thanks. Thanks so much, Ian. That was super interesting and inspiring as well. Uh, really cool stuff happening in Detroit. We're obviously here in Google Detroit. We're all big fans of the city and what's going on. We keep a very close eye on the pulse of the city. Um, so very great, though, to get perspective from outside of Google as well, and really interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> I'm not a pessimist by any means, um, quite the opposite, in fact. But let me start with more of a pessimistic type question. You talk a lot about what could happen to make Detroit the next capital of unicorns. On the other side of that, what do you think potentially could happen that would make it fail, right? What, what could bloat the opportunity? What could cause it to potentially crumble? Um, from the opportunity that lies ahead. 
Yeah, I, I mean, A, I, I just think it's the opposite of what, of what we talked about, right? If, if those ingredients don't come together, but more importantly, I think the number one is uh, will, will the talent be able to get, get out of those companies and start companies? Without the, without the founders, there really is nothing. Um, so I, I think it's, it, it lives and dies by those people who are willing to go and, and take that risk and, and be courageous and start a company. Yeah, and, and, and a lot of the talent in this city historically has focused on the automakers, right, in the auto industry, the peripheral of the auto industry as well. And, uh, you know, you put the stat up that shows engineering talent, STEM talent in both cities, um, Seattle versus Detroit. And I know historically a lot of that has lied, laid within uh, the automotive industry. How how do companies like a like a StockX or a Duo how do they go in and pull talent from somebody who maybe has been working at the same company for 15, 20 years? What's what's the tactic for something like that to happen, or does it have to happen more organically where people want to move from those positions? To be fully transparent, I have no idea how a company with 500 people like a StockX or, or so would would go in and recruit. Exactly. Right, um, yeah. <laughs> but but for like, like using my lens on the world, which is companies that don't even exist at all, starting them, how do you pull talent to go and start a business? Is right. it like just you or you and one or two other people? Um, uh, you know, what we have found successful is showing people the light in many ways, right? Like uh, one of the things that I think is, is kind of interesting about Detroit is there isn't an equity focus at all. Mm -hmm. um, so I've talked to many people in big companies as well as in small companies who will say like, yeah, I don't have I don't have any equity at all, uh, or uh, that's not something that I care about, or all, all the way to things like, oh yeah, well the company has promised me that if something good happens, they'll take care of me. And I'm like, well, why don't you just get that in writing? Like, yeah. put that down in writing and have some stock. Um, so one of the things that we've really had to do is train people of the value of equity, which is a admittedly very hard sell, right? It's saying like, hey, yeah, your salary is maybe going to go down. Uh, for the people who are right at the start, is definitely going to go down, and uh, but you're going to make up with it, make up for it with this equity, and they're like, uh, teach me how that actually matters because as far as I can tell, that's worth nothing. I'm like, yeah, it's actually worth nothing today. Uh, the idea is that you make it worth something. So I, I think, um, you know, there is there is a we we are very organic about it with going in, looking at particular people, saying, do you want to start a company? You have to want it yourself. So if, if you don't want it, then it doesn't matter at all. Like that's just it's not worth having that discussion. But if you're intrinsically motivated, then it's okay. What are the ways that we can actually get you out of that seat? And it's salary, it's equity, it's comp and, and culture. And I, I think culture is a big one as well. Where you know many of the automakers are old big companies with a lot of politics and bureaucratic. So, so yeah. Yeah, and historically, uh, the kind of metro area of Detroit and sometimes Michigan in general has led to a lot of risk adversity, right? Uh, the city of Detroit, for example, filed for bankruptcy just a few short years ago. And so a lot of folks, when you start looking at people's um, kind of openness to move from a big established company to a startup, uh, where you're talking about this, the power of equity, yeah. uh, they're like, yeah, there's no chance yeah. because our city just went bankrupt and we're in a fairly stable job, maybe not even, um, and we're, we're a little scared to move at this point. You talked a little bit in your blog about the bankruptcy of Detroit. Can you talk a little bit about what your perspective is on the bankruptcy filing a few years ago and, and how that's led to you know, your presentation and where we are today, whether it's a good or bad thing? Yeah, I mean, and net net, the, the bankruptcy was, was absolutely a good thing. Yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, from a from a government perspective, it, it actually set this, the the city up. From a financial perspective, it set the city up. Um, you know, I, I think actually one of the most underrated uh, underrated pieces of the bankruptcy that at least that I believe is that the transition from uh, the emergency manager Kevin Orr to Duggan as mayor was more or less flawless. Like that that went really really well. Um, we can quibble about like the, the, the <laughs> sure. small pieces, but, sure. but like all in all, like I think that was actually pretty good. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so that like that is from like the, maybe the policy side of the world. Financial side of the world, it, it, like it just had to be done. So it, good, like we did it. It actually turned lights back on for people, right? Like that's, so that's a good thing too. Um, from a cultural perspective, which I think is much more important, I think it 
made people realize like it can't get worse. Right? Like we're we're done. Like this is this is the rock bottom. We've hit it. It's never going to get worse than this. Uh, and now we can pick our heads up and say, what do we want to do? What do we want to build in this city? And how do we want to build it? And let's go. Let's just go do it. So yeah. I think culturally it's awesome. Not quite a blank slate, but yeah. It's close to a blank slate as you can get in yeah. modern era, I suppose, right? Yeah. Um, you talk, I've got a quote here too, um, also from your blog, plug for your blog, two plugs for your blog, yeah. <laughs> um, you talk about talent, and, and this quote really jumped out to me, and, and I want to hear you kind of talk about it a little bit more. You said, you know, when you're looking at talent from a startup perspective, you should rate people on inputs, not the outputs, um, which I thought was a really interesting concept. Can you talk a little bit more about what, kind of what you mean by that and how it plays into kind of what we're talking about with, with startups and unicorns and things like that? Yeah. yeah, to be clear, that was Jeff Bezos' quote that I, that I really love. Clarification, <laughs> yeah. Jeff Bezos' <laughs> yeah, yeah. quote. Um, maybe that's why I loved it so yeah, much. It was exactly. brilliant. I was like, this is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> nice job. <laughs> um, uh, but but I, I, think it's, I think it's really important because startups are meant to fail. If you judged people on whether they succeeded or failed alone, uh, pretty much everybody would fail and you would have no idea if that was good or bad. Rate people on the process and, and their decision making. Right? Like, Why did they make decisions that they made? Did that contribute to the failure or did, was the failure external to that? Uh, and, and even if it did contribute to the failure, was it still a good process with the information that they had at the time? Uh, and for us, we're like, I, I know most of our startups are gonna fail. Um, that's okay. I, I'm, I'm, my day is mostly built around how do I say no to things and because they're going to fail. And, and then the ones that I say yes to, I'm like, well, they're probably going to fail too. Um, so it's about making sure that we have really great decision making frameworks and processes around that. And we want that out of, out of the entrepreneurs that we, that we bring on as well. Yeah. And, and learning too throughout the entire process, right? Yeah. It's always a, a constant learning process from start to finish, whether totally. it succeeds or fails. Um, it, this is a very generic question, I know, but um, I'm interested just from your time working in the industry, what, what you say about this. So every once in a while, you'll see a first time founder succeed. Yeah. Um, and then many times you see long-term entrepreneurs fail over and over and over and over again before they find something that su succeeds, if they ever do. Yeah. Is there anything, I know you went through the different steps of what could potentially lead to a successful startup or even a unicorn, um, but is there anything just like organically that you see in some of these stories where a, a first-time founder succeeds or a long-time entrepreneur doesn't succeed? Are there any sparks, anything that just you know, has kind of raised your eyebrow outside of like the norm where you're like, wow, that's really interesting or, or maybe out of the norm of what we see? You know, I, I think for the um, first time founder succeeding versus maybe a serial entrepreneur who has succeeded in the past but, but fails later on, one of the things that I've seen is those people who have some success and want to go do it again, they forget what it was like early on. And, and actually, like, uh, I'm totally a, a victim of this in many ways. Um, you forget what it was like early on to say, I've got nothing. Uh, I need to just go hustle and find out what do my customers actually want me to build and go build that and get them to pay you. A, a founder who has been successful in the past often has a really easy time raising money, also often has a really easy time uh, recruiting people because people have seen that success and they're like, oh, of course I'm going to go do it. Yeah. But they forget to actually go through the fundamentals of what is this business going to do? And so you get 12, 24 months down the line, and it's like, oh, that's a, that's a total failure. Versus somebody who is first time, they're like, they're like, I, like I can't go raise money because nobody knows me, and I don't know anybody else with money, and I'm not going to put any of my own money in because I don't have any money. Uh, and so they're, they, you know, nobody wants to trust them to join the team, so they're just like, i got to hack at this until it works, and i got to keep selling and, and keep growing the thing. So that, that's probably the biggest difference on the ones that succeed versus fail. I think for the people who, who continue to fail, right, like over and over again, I mean, I've seen it both ways where I, I'm, I'm just a pure believer that like, in some cases those are people who just shouldn't be doing it, but in, in <laughs> most cases, sure. they've just been unlucky, yeah. like honestly. Yeah. And, it, and more swings at bat is better. Sure. Yeah, well, here at Google we, we have a, many philosophies, but one is 
fail fast and fail often, right? And and the most important piece is when you do fail, learn from it as well, mm -hmm. right? What you don't want to see is somebody failing over mm -hmm. and over again and then going back to bat doing the exact yeah. same thing, swinging at that's pitches right. that are way outside. That's right. You're like, okay, well, that, <laughs> that's probably not the best person to, to be investing in. But if they're learning from it and coming back and, and trying a different approach or switching sides of the plate or whatever it, want, whatever it might be, then you're like, okay, they're learning from these failures and there can be some positivity behind it. That's right. And, and, and to like, to keep that baseball analogy going. Yeah, let's keep running with well, it. I one, like this. One of, the, one, of the things that, one of the things that we think about is we're in the home run business, but we, we are not in the what is, what is our batting average business. We are not in the slugging percentage. Sure. Right? Like we are in the business of hitting home runs. The best way to hit home runs is to swing, right? Like keep taking swings, keep figuring out what pitches you should be swinging at. Uh, and go for it, knowing that you're probably not going to hit a home run on most of them, but you only need one of them, right? Yeah. Like, you only need one massive success to be massively successful. Absolutely. It's easy to sit in the stands and critique a batter for not swinging or swinging yeah. too often, but you're not up there actually looking at things, and it changes your perspective completely. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, the difference between, like, more of a traditional incubator versus, like, a startup studio? Yeah. And, like, what, the, what kind of makes one one thing and the other another thing. Um, we've seen a lot of successes come from startup studios recently uh, where they've kind of built um, Dollar Shave Club, I know is one that, that I use that comes to mind. That's built out of a startup studio. Talk about kind of the, the difference between those two and why one might be better or worse than the other, yeah. or maybe not better or worse, but different than yeah. one another. I'll, I'll actually expand it to um, sort of like traditional old school incubators. Sure new school accelerators yep. and okay. startup studios. Yep. So, three steps. so um, old school incubators are a, a, a little weird because often what they were was a physical space that companies could get started at and they would have a back office accounting team that you could you know, use them for for, I don't know, a thousand bucks a month or whatever. They'd have a back office legal team that you could pay for. They'd have a back office marketing team, right? Like uh, that the incubator would, would supply all that, and then a startup could just come in and use those services as long as they paid for those. Um, that killed many startups because many startups, their most valuable resource that they have at the time is, is cash. And the incentives are really misaligned. So sure. the incentives of the incubator are to, how do we charge as much money as possible so that we can make as much profit as possible bringing these folks in? And the startup is like, I need to spend as little money as possible, right, and, and do whatever I can do to not pay money. Um, so the incentives are really, are really awkward there. In the accelerator model, this is typically um, uh, like a Techstars as an example, which, which we went through. So I'm, I'm a fan of the accelerator model. Sure. Yep. They are, we'll take a small amount of equity for a small amount of money. We'll send you through uh, a, a sort of short accelerator program, which is typically like three months. We will essentially pressure test you, stress test you, and you'll come out the other side a little bit better. And, and we'll, we'll give you access to our network to help it make it easier for you to recruit, to raise money, to sell, whatever it might be. Um, and so those typically take companies that have a fully formed team, right, like three, four people, a fully formed idea, probably some semblance of a product already, maybe some semblance of revenue already. Um, and then they spit it out the other side, right? Yep. Our model is, and I think most studio models are, um, there is no team necessarily, maybe one person. There is uh, barely an idea. There is no product. There is no customers. Uh, instead of taking them in for a short amount of time, we spend a long amount of time on it. We act as true co-founders, typically spend six to nine months almost full time on, on a company. Uh, and then we ultimately, help recruit the team, bring them in, uh, give a little bit of money, take equity, and then send them on their way. So. Sure. And, and why do you think, if you do, yeah. uh, why do you, I, I think you do, because that's what do. you do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't want to put words in your mouth. Um, why do you think moving to a startup studio, why do you think the model has progressed to that, and why do you think that's the maybe the most potent way to move into the, to yeah. the, kind of the, the entrepreneurial game? Yeah, well, from our perspective, it's all about the talent, right? Uh, everything is about the talent. Sure. And uh, I think, in many ways, the, the startup studio is the ultimate way to help an entrepreneur become an entrepreneur. So um, particularly in regions like, like Metro Detroit, uh, I think that a studio is better than a traditional incubator or an accelerator because our model is 
There is a lot of really great talent here. We believe in that talent. We just know that not a lot of that talent yet has startup experience. And so if we can apply our startup experience to their domain knowledge or engineering knowledge, whatever it might be, um, together we can build incredible companies early on. And so we can build that process of building a startup. They can build that process of, uh, of understanding their, their, their idea and their business. Yeah, and, and I think the time is, is ripe now too because there's a lot of folks that are moving to Detroit, right? So a lot of people who have been based here historically might be risk averse or maybe don't have a lot of startup mm -hmm. Um, background, as we were mentioning earlier, but when you walk the streets now and you talk to people, there's folks that are moving from the East Coast and the West Coast and outside the country, and so you're starting to infuse uh, potentially new talent that does potentially have startup yep. uh, uh, backgrounds. But you pe see people coming in from the from Silicon Valley saying it's too expensive out there. Uh, there's great things about the valley, but we'd rather come here and, and try our hand in Detroit. We see a lot of people coming in from New York City with the same issues, it's too expensive there, so they come here. So there's an infusion, I think, going on right now of talent that also brings about experience and a little bit of a different way of thinking than historically has been in Detroit as well. Yeah, about 30% of our talent pipeline is people who either have moved here from the coast really? okay. or okay. want to move here from the coast. Yeah, that's awesome. Any questions from the audience? Yeah, I was just wondering, um, Kind of how do you uh, look at, uh, how, how should a founder look at like personal risk assessment and whether or not, and how do you look at that too when you're trying to, trying to pick a founder that you want to partner with uh, to know that they're really in it for the right reasons and that they can stay in the you know, startup 12, 24 months after launches? Yeah, uh, well w the question that we ask is, is um, not 12 months. We, we say, is this something that you're willing to do for the next 10 years of your life? Because uh, that's what good startups take a really long time to, to grow, right? So um, we, we, like, honestly, we just, we ask the question straight up. So we say, like, are you willing to do this for the next 10 years of your life? If the answer is no, cool, that's no problem. Let's work together on maybe you can join the company, but we should bring somebody else into the company. Um, clearly, there, there's, there's an amount of financial risk that a, a person can take or not take. Uh, we pay our founders, but we do not pay them a lot. We, like, and that is sort of by design. I think I'd like to pay our founders more if I had more money to pay them, but, um, but I never want them to be paid a lot of money, right? Like I want you to be incentivized by the equity. Um, so that, that's like one is, is just sort of like what does their financial situation look like and, and can they make it work? Um, and can we make it work as well? Like can we pay you enough to, to get you out? Um, is that something that you want to do for the next 10 years of your life? Where does the idea come from? Right? We spend a ton of time on, on the actual business and saying like, did this person come to us with the idea or did we recruit that person to come work on this idea? Um, and if we recruited the person, like, that's great, that's part of our model, but we spend a lot more time on like, are you really passionate about this idea? I think fundamentally we, we focus a lot on founder, founder problem fit, right? which is like, does, that, does the founder love that problem? I don't care if they love the idea necessarily, because the idea is probably gonna change, but do they love that problem a lot? And, and if they love the problem, then that's awesome. But I'm not sure we have a great answer to that question yet. We'll, we'll see how it goes. TBD. Yeah. <laughs> when Steve Case and JD Vance came through with the Rise of the Rust tour, they also commented on this dichotomy or perceived dichotomy between the Ann Arbor community and Detroit community, and you touched on it as well. So I'm curious to hear, um, in your example of Seattle, was there like a Kirkland Bellevue totally. Seattle identity? And like, how did they overcome that if they did? And what maybe from your perspective or experience could the Detroit and Ann Arbor communities do better to be seen as a more collaborative space in Southeast Michigan? Yeah, uh, great question. And, and the answer is yes. The east side to Seattle, it felt like uh, there's, a li there's a literal lake that separates them, right? Um, but it felt like it was an ocean. And mostly we did not interact with the Bellevue startups and the Bellevue founders. That got better over time, particularly as Seattle invested in public transit. I, I think it's a um, it's it's sort of a, an obvious answer, but it actually works. So um, yeah, I, I think that's what, like one thing that I would love to see is Detroit and Ann Arbor figure out how do you get better transportation between the two cities. 
Um, and then the other thing is just culturally, let's actually just decide that we're going to work together and not, and not apart from each other. I think the transportation one is huge. You talked about you know, where do you build um, kind of an, an influence between the two cities, and it's probably right here. It's right downtown, yeah. right? And in the, the main, there's space down here, right? There's talent down here. There's space to live. There's space to build out companies. Um, and the cost is still fairly low, um, although rising. Um, but yeah, there's not a, a lot of great transportation right now between Ann Arbor and Detroit, despite being just a few miles apart, right? And it makes it very difficult for folks to move back and forth, especially during rush hours, right? Yeah. So I think that's a huge one. Um, let me end on kind of one high-level question. Um, you know, what do you think is next for Detroit? Like, what do you think? You, know, you talked a little bit about movement in in with engineers and talent around that area. Anything else from a high level that you think is next? Anything else that you think could grow out of the city of Detroit moving forward? Yeah, I mean, I hope it's unicorns. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, but, but realistically, like I, I think over the next five to 10 years, I fully expect that we will see a company worth over $10 billion built here in Detroit. And that will probably bring in 10,000 employees. Um, and that alone will, will reshape this city significantly. Um, and then, and then I would go back to my other point on equity. Like that's the other thing that I think is next for Detroit is sure. figuring out how to understand what equity really means uh, and why that's important for the startup ecosystem. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for all of your time today. You really appreciate it. This is the official invite. We'll have you back in a few years right. to check base to yeah. see we'll what's see. happening with you guys and in, in the city of Detroit. And we'll see. Did you did you nail it? Did you miss some things in between? And we'll, we'll grade things out, okay? If, if we good? failed, we'll own it and we'll learn from it. And if <laughs> exactly. we succeeded, it'll be great. Cool. Thanks so much, man. Thank Appreciate you. it. Yeah, thank you.